Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, see, this is lecture number six, I believe. And uh, let me first ask if you can hear uh, what's being said. Is the sound clear and good? Right in the chat window, if you would. Do you hear it? Okay, good. Um, we are going to continue our discussion about inelastic scattering. And today we're going to focus um, again on inelastic nuclear scattering. So we're going to be talking about using neutrons to probe phonons in materials. And I'm going to pick up more or less, or pick up more or less where we uh, where we ended last, a little bit further back to make sure that we are uh, back in in context again. And I'd like to start by writing uh, the expression that we um, obtain for the inelastic partial differential scattering cross section um, in the Born approximation once we introduced the Fermi soda potential. So this looks like as follows. Uh, we have the ratio of velocities that, that come in. Uh, we have the bound coherent scattering length squared. We have our Fourier transform. Uh, we have a summation, double summation of all um, sites in our lattice. And as I've tried to emphasize, in principle, we don't have to have a uh, periodic structure at this point, but we do have copies of that same interaction potential. And then we have finally uh, the, the most critical term, uh, which is the two-point space and time correlation function. In the case of the, uh, of the uh, phonon nucleus scattering cross-section, it looks as follows. E to the minus i q dotted with r l at time zero, because remember we've now used uh, time-dependent uh, operators in the Heisenberg picture, as it were, and then e to the i q r l prime at time t. So that is our expression. Now, if I've managed to have to uh, actually um, focus on the case where there's just one scattering length, so I don't really have a complicated unit cell uh, to deal with. I just have one atom per a unit cell. Um, it becomes somewhat more complicated if we if we um, add uh, complexity in the unit cells. I'm holding off from that. Now I want to talk a little bit about this part of the expression. Okay, and I'm going to give it a name. Let's call it phi of t. It's a time-dependent function. See, it depends on time, and it's a thermal equilibrium of this so-called two-point correlation function because it involves. Uh, a nucleus at site L, a nucleus at site L prime, and involves the correlations between uh, these phase factors for those nuclei at different times. So it's a pretty complicated function, uh, if you will, but um, let's consider a little bit uh, what's going to happen depending on its behavior as a function of time. So I'm going to make some statements which are actually quite uh, generally applicable, uh, and this is why I think it's actually useful to look at it in this particular case. So you'll notice that this expression is essentially a time Fourier transform of this function. We're going to suppress a little bit the spatial part of it all, which is this summation. And just think about the fact that we have a time Fourier transform of this function that relates to the uh, inelastic scattering cross-section. And I want to think about different possible behaviors of this time correlation function. If we are dealing with a solid, uh, then we will in fact in general find that there will be a finite value of this time correlation function when time goes to infinite. Because the atoms are in some sort of uh, vibrational motion around some average positions that we've indexed by L and L prime. So this function actually ends up having some sort of finite value even when t goes to infinite. I'm just going to sketch what that typically would look like here. So this is my, this is my phi of t function. And what I'm saying is that if I have a solid then I'd expect even when time gets very, very large, then there is a finite limit. So this, there will be some sort of finite value here. This is, this is zero, but there's a finite value for my phi of t. And then as I come towards zero, there'll be some sort of peak because uh, there are perhaps stronger correlations at shorter times. Um, I'm, as I said, suppressing the spatial dependence uh, 
But I, let, me, let me make the answer so that that's what that time-dependent phi function looks like. And let's then think what the partial differential scattering cross-section would look like. Because it's going to be a Fourier transform of this entity. And so when I come to looking at my uh, inelastic scattering cross-section, then I'm going to look at it as a function of energy transfer. Remember, energy transfer is simply uh, how much energy was delivered of the kinetic energy of the incoming neutron to the sample. So this is something that we can really measure experimentally. Now, the consequence of having a finite value of phi of t when time goes infinite is that this time interval will keep going and going for a very long period of time. And as you know, if this one goes for an infinite period of time, it actually produces a Dirac delta function. So the consequence of a finite limit when t goes to infinite, infinity is that there will be uh, a delta function right here at the, at the origin of zero time. So the, here will be my Dirac delta function, delta h bar omega. So that is my elastic scattering. It's related to the long time a part of the two-point correlation function. Then, in addition, as a result of this peak towards zero, I'm also going to get some sort of peak um, uh, towards zero uh, frequency or zero energy. And if I was to denote the characteristic width of this thing as tau, a time constant, not a reciprocal lattice vector, so I'm reusing tau here. So if this was the characteristic width of the peak in time, tau, then this peak is going to have some sort of characteristic width, which might be h bar divided by tau. So from this width, I'm going to derive what happens in time. And so this is sort of the nature of the, of the uh, translation, if you will, between the time two-point correlation function and the inelastic scattering cross-section. Uh, and if I have a solid, then I have a finite limit when time goes to infinite, and then I'm going to have a direct delta function and elastic scattering. This is what Takeshi Igami described as recoil from the entire crystal. And that's an, a perfectly appropriate uh, way of, uh, of saying that as well. So here you're seeing how it sort of comes out of the quantum mechanics. On the other hand, if we had a liquid, if we think about a liquid instead, then what's going to happen, I'm going to draw it here. So let me just write solid. If we have a liquid instead, then we expect that as time goes on, I'm going to lose all uh, correlation between my particles, which are at some great distance uh, between each other. So therefore, my phi of t function, phi of t, uh, it can have certainly a peak around zero in time. But eventually, when time goes very, very far, because I have a completely dynamic state uh, that has no sort of memory of past conditions, eventually this correlation function will completely vanish when time becomes very large. The result of that is that there cannot be a delta function in the uh, scattering cross-section. And therefore, my, um, my uh, scattering cross-section, I guess I didn't write what it was I was plotting here, but I was plotting uh, the energy dependence of d2 sigma d omega d dE prime. If I plot the same thing here, so d2 sigma d omega dE prime, then I would expect to have some sort of peak around the elastic position. And we're going to talk more about the nature of that uh, peak and the fact that it can actually be asymmetric around zero. In general, it would be asymmetric around zero. Uh, but I'm, I'm showing some sort of very simple case here just to make the point that for a liquid, I'm never going to actually be able to produce a delta function at zero. And this is something you really do see in experiments when we, um, when we have a sample which might be something like liquid helium. If that's all that's in the beam, there really is no elastic scattering at all. It really does come out like that. But as soon as you put something in which is, uh, which is, um, uh, has static correlations, then you see this delta function developing. And so anytime you have something which is, uh, which is a, of a solid condition in the beam, then you're going to expect to see this elastic peak uh, in the spectrum. OK, so that was my first little uh, consideration. And then I want to continue, basically, to develop this uh, expression. And I'm going to. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the very simple case of an Einstein mode uh, in a crystal. In that condition, or for that simple situation, we can completely write out this function and appreciate the various aspects of it. And then we're going to go from that to sort of generalize to the lattice case of phonons collective modes in a crystal. We'll see how far we can get in that little uh, design. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look a little further in this direction at 
this two-point correlation function. Let me do it here. Um, so I'm just going to do that to indicate the, the bracket that I had written <coughs> excuse me, previously. And this step we actually did describe before, and it, had to, it uh, relied on the harmonic approximation. As soon as we have a harmonic crystal, uh, then we, uh, we have um, a way to rewrite uh, this um, uh, two-point correlation function of phase factors as follows. There's something that we call the Debye-Waller factor, thermal expectation value of Q dot U quantity squared. Um, and then there is a um, Taylor expansion, essentially, of the remainder term, which looks as follows, 1 plus expectation value of Q dot UL, um, UL0, and then Q dot UL prime at time T. And then we have plus lots of other um, stuff that we're not going to worry about. This is the so-called multiphonon expansion. Um, and as we discussed previously, this term um, holds all of the two-point correlation function, which has a finite limit when time goes to infinite. And this term, therefore, accounts for the elastic scattering. And we discussed that previously. Uh, we ended up with exactly the same expression as we had for the static potential augmented just by the appearance of this Debye-Waller factor, which described the vibrations of atoms around their uh, equilibrium position. Um, I should remind you that U is a displacement operator, so that I'm now describing an atom as being a you know, time-dependent position operator, if you will, which has a, an average position, which we call RL, and a time-dependent displacement. And what I'm saying is that this term gives elastic scattering. This term, on the other hand, because these displacements um, in the way we've defined things here uh, necessarily, necessarily um, um, operators that have a time average that goes to zero, um, for that reason, this term cannot give any elastic scattering. It should just be inelastic scattering. This term necessarily vanishes for t goes to infinite. So this will be elastic, this will be inelastic. And so our task today, if you will, is to uh, spend a little time to look at this term and see how it's going to behave. All right, so I want to, um, I want to take a specific case and think about the specific case of a um, Einstein, we could call it an Einstein solid that only has as its excitation uh, an Einstein mode of um, mode of vibration. So we have um, atoms that sit statically on a lattice, and then they can vibrate with some particular resonance frequency, but there's no um, sort of coherent vibrational excitation in the system at all. So this allows me to basically work my th way through the, um, through the calculation. And so um, the, um, I think actually I have to come back here uh, to to do this. Can I use that? Okay. This okay. All right. Here we go. All right. So, uh, so my. Uh, description of the atom is going to be simply a harmonic oscillator, 1 over 2, capital M for the mass of the atom. You should be careful because we've got little m for mass of neutron, capital M for mass of atom, and then a momentum squared plus um, half mass omega 0 squared, and then there's going to be an R squared. Uh, so this is going to be a, we could call it a isotropic harmonic oscillator, or spherical harmonic oscillator, uh, any way the atom displaces away from its average position, uh, it has this re um, restoring force um, that gives rise to that term, harmonic term. And of course, we know how to solve this problem. And um, since it's an isotropic problem, I can actually initially think just about the x direction. And then I'll be able to generalize quite in a quite straightforward fashion um, later by adding in quadrature x, y, and z directions. So 
um, the steps that I take is we introduce a um, um, decomposition, if you will, of the position operator into uh, bosonic raising and lowering operators. And this is what it, it looks like, m omega 0. This is the prefactor. And this prefactor will actually end up showing up in our various expressions. This is why I just want to remind you uh, what it looks like. And then we have a plus a dagger. Now, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the raising and the lowering operator uh, that are going to, going to show up. And we have a similar expression for the um, momentum operator, which is um, h bar m omega 0. Oops, I do it right. Yes, divided by 2. And then this is a operator minus a dagger. So these position and momentum operators, of course, have to satisfy our, um, they have to satisfy our uh, commutation relation. Um, that should be equals to i h bar. And this implies that these raising and lowering operators satisfy this commutation relation, a a dagger is equals to 1. So this means that these are actually bosonic operators. And <clears throat> using this way of uh, writing out the position and momentum operator, put that back into the Hamiltonian, and we find this uh, well-known result uh, that we have um, uh, quantized bosonic vibrational excitations uh, that, take, uh, that take the Hamiltonian into this, into this form plus a half, as such. And you recall that A dagger A is a number operator measuring how many quanta of excitations are in that particular eigenstate. Um, and a half actually accounts for the zero-point energy um, of the system. So there is um, some sort of dynamic nature to the state even at t equals to zero in this, uh, even when I don't have any phonons involved, uh, I have some wave function which is distributed in position space basically as a, as a result of the um, um, uh, uncertainty relation. Uh, so that's the, that's the harmonic oscillator. And I want to remind you of the thermodynamics of the harmonic oscillator as well. If we, um, if we ensure that this harmonic oscillator is in thermal equilibrium, then the expectation value of A dagger A is going to be equals to what we will call N of omega 0 in this case because the, the frequency is for that oscillator is omega 0. And just to remind you what this looks like, it's 1 divided by e to the beta h bar omega 0 minus 1. That's the Bose population factor. OK, so those are all the preliminaries. And now I want to use this framework to actually carry out the calculation of this two-point correlator in the case of these um, bosonic vibrational excitations. And so for that, I'm going to Come over here to the left. And of course, my first step is going to have to be to introduce time-dependent raising and uh, raising and lowering operators. Um, so as you remember, we, um, in writing the inelastic scattering cross-section, uh, we actually r uh, dealt with these time-dependent operators. And in this uh, so-called Heisenberg picture, um, we can write equations of motions, which are essentially the Ehrenfest uh, relation, uh, which say that I h bar d um, d d t of my uh, lowering operator in this case is equals to uh, commutator of a comma h comma the whole um, the whole uh, Hamilton operator which then becomes equals to h bar omega 0 commutator of a comma a dagger a. Because we wrote down here what the Hamilton operator was. It had this number operator showing up. So it really ends up being the time derivative of the, of the uh, Bose operator a is related to this particular commutator. And of course, I can work out that commutator knowing that these are uh, Bose operators. And this ends up becoming equals to h bar omega 0 times a itself. So then I have a very simple uh, time dependence to that uh, lowering operator uh, such that I can infer that a as a function of time 
is going to be equal to a at zero time, and then e to the minus i omega zero t. And I can take the adjunct of this expression to get the time dependence of the uh, raising operator, and I will say that a dagger t is equal to a dagger e to the i omega zero t. And those expressions are essentially all I need to then develop the time-dependent two-point uh, correlation function that we need to describe the inelastic scattering from these uh, Einstein modes. And to take the next step, then I'm going to I'm going to come over I'm going to come over here. Um, so now I need to look at uh, this. Uh, two-point correlator, which just going to remind you what it, what it uh, ultimately it was a dot product that showed up. But I'm going to first look at only the x um, components of it, and then I can I can eventually generalize. So there'll be a qx, and then a we call them u in this case, and I guess I was using a displacement operator r. So the x component of, of r, I'm going to call it ux. So it's ux at time equals to zero. And then q x u y uh, at time equals to t. Now, uh, you will notice that I have dropped my position indexes here. I'm just talk. Sorry, this should also be x. I'm just talking about the displacement operators on one particular side of the lattice, and that's because I don't have any correlations in the motion of the of the uh, Einstein mode on side L as compared to side L prime. So there won't be any spatial correlations at all involved in this problem. And so the two-point correlation function actually vanishes whenever it talks about uh, correlations between distant sites. So the only part of that makes sense to write down is, if you will, the diagonal part, uh, just involving one uh, uh, a single site. And I'm, of that, I'm writing down just the x component. So this is what I have to do. Um, and it's actually pretty pretty straightforward to, st forward to proceed. Q will come out um, in front as a Q squared. And then I get uh, UX shows up twice. And here, uh, my factor that you remember that we had uh, in writing position operator in terms of raising lowering operators, this square root is going to now show up, but it'll come squared. So I'll get rid of the square root. And what I end up with is an H bar qx squared divided by twice mass of the atom, not the neutron, the atom. And you'll notice that this thing has dimension of an energy. And then if you remember, there was an omega 0 in the denominator. This, I'll write it h bar omega 0. And now this is a dimensionless factor. And all of this thing has to be dimensionless. So that, that is the expression. So just remember when you see this term showing up in your cross sections, that in a sense it has its origin in this uh, decomposition of the position operator into raising and lowering operators. It, it, you'll see that this one shows up and has quite a significance in our uh, understanding of the scattering cross-section. OK, so that's uh, that part. And then I do have this thermal, thermal average of ux at time equals to 0. And uh, this is a um, plus a dagger. And it's prefect I already have dealt with. And then this guy is ux at time t. And so that would be a e to the minus i omega 0 t. We, did, we got its uh, time dependence from the equation of motion, which was the Ehrenfest uh, relation. And then we get plus a dagger e to the plus i omega 0 t. So we have those two terms showing up. And we need a thermal average. Um, and you're going to see as we go forward that this term ends up being related to um, phonon annihilation, and this term will be related to phonon uh, creation. So the, all of the components that are natural and must appear in the cross section are already seen developing out of this expression. But we can take a few more steps. Um, the prefactor doesn't change. Uh, and here, I get some terms which involve two lowering operators and two raising operators. And those won't actually give me anything. 
because if you remember what this thermal average looks like, it's a sum of all uh, eigenstates, thermal, thermal um, occupation probability, and this matrix element between identical eigenstates will not give it, get a finite value if I don't have the same number of raising and lowering operators. So those terms actually drop out, and all I have are the terms that, that have one raising and one lowering operator. And those look as follows, expectation value of A, A dagger, actually let me write this one first, A dagger A, A dagger A, E to the minus I omega zero T, that was this guy with that, and then I get this guy with that one gives me a plus A, A dagger, E to the I omega zero T. And all of that I have to take um, a thermal expectation value of. Okay, so now I'm going to continue, continue up here. You can still see it. Uh, so this entire expression is continuing the same, uh, the same prefactor. Uh, same prefactor. And then this guy from the Statistical physics of the harmonic oscillator, we already wrote that that was just the Bose population factor. So this will now be n of omega zero, the angular frequency associated with that Einstein mode, and then an e to the minus i omega zero t. Okay, this guy is a little bit more tricky, but I do know the commutation relation, which says that which says that a comma a dagger is equals to one, and this implies that a a dagger, which is what we need to figure out, is equal to 1 plus A dagger A. And A dagger A, its expectation value was Bose population factor. So this is just 1. So the expectation value of this guy is, is equal to 1 plus the expectation value of the number operator. So I'm going to get A plus 1 plus N omega 0 E to the plus I omega 0 T. Okay, so this expression has, uh, has now, it, it's really taking, taking form uh, quite nicely. And we, we're going to eventually feed it back into our inelastic expression. But let me just say a few words about it. Okay, the, the first thing I want to mention is that in the limit where temperature is very high, the Bose occupation number is going to become very large. And in that case, this one actually doesn't play a role at all. And then I just basically end up with... Um, I end up with the n omega zero times uh, this phase factor plus that phase factor. And that's actually equals to, so let's say in the limit of t, um, um, let's say it really is the limit where beta h bar omega zero is much, much less than the very high temperature than one. Okay, that would be the high temperature limit. In that limit, this just becomes equals to same prefactor times twice n omega zero times um, a, let's say it becomes a cos to omega zero t. And there will be, a, let's see, we have, yes, that is correct. So we end up with that expression. And I just want to remind you that what I have developed here is in a sense, or it really is, the time dependence of the two-point correlation function, which we started off talking about. Remember when we talked about phi of t and the importance of whether it was zero or not in the large time limit? Uh, well, in this case, you see it's just an oscillating function. So our phi of t, function of t, our phi of t in this case is just, is just looking like this, just oscillates like that. Um, and this function clearly doesn't have a finite value and the limit of time goes to infinite. Well, we have to be a little careful. It has a finite value, but it doesn't average to a finite value and the limit of time goes to infinite. And that means that this term is not going to produce any elastic scattering. That was expected because we were working on the inelastic term. Uh, furthermore, we see that we have this nice coherent wave. And so we're going to expect when we take a time Fourier transform of that, that we're going to get a sharp peak in the spectrum at a value of frequency or a value of energy transfer that matches this angular frequency. So that's the natural frequency of the harmonic oscillator. And that will essentially be the indication that we have delivered a quantum of um, energy or received a quantum of energy from this harmonic or from this um, 
Einstein mode. Good. So now let me let me then put this expression into my expression for the scattering cross section. I'm going to do that all writing in the chat board, and, and I hope uh, John will alert me to any questions that might uh, arise there. Very happy to answer any questions. Um, sorry. Right. Okay. Good. Uh, so yeah. So let me just uh, first mention that um, in the calculation of the cross section, I'm going to see things like integral one over two pi h bar integral dt e to the minus i omega t. Right. That was my time integral that shows up, and then I'm going to have my e to the minus or plus i omega zero t. Right. So this is a a trivial integral to, to carry out, knowing the um, uh, knowing this spectral resolution of the Dirac delta function, this simply becomes equal to delta function of h bar omega, and for the minus sign, I'm going to get I'm going to get a uh, plus actually uh, like that. This is what it's going to look like. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, my debye waller factor showing up. And the debye waller factor is involving um, involves a q dot u uh, squared and its expectation value, and it's actually the it's like it's e to the minus this uh, this function. Now this function is actually the um, two point time correlation function evaluated at time equals to zero. If you remember what the two-point correlation function was, it had two of these terms at different times. So this debye waller factor is just a certain very specific value of my phi of t function. And actually it becomes, I just have to put t equals to zero into my uh, correlation function. And if we can uh, remember what, uh, what was there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to take a, uh, let's see, I'll take a peek here. Um, so I had this nice ratio of energies. Uh, like that, and then I have actually two times the Bose population factors. The phase factors don't show up anymore because those um, were evaluated at t equals to zero, and then I have plus uh, one. Uh, so this one, th these, this one I can actually develop um, quite easily, and I, I'll, um, uh, I won't. won't Spend your, I won't spend your time uh, doing that, I think, um, 2m h bar omega 0. This one, um, eh, OK. Uh, so you, you can write down this guy here. We, we told you what the n of omega 0 looks like. And if you put it all on its uh, common denominator and so on, um, you will find uh, a very simple expression. Actually, it en ends up being equal to cot hyperbolic of a half beta h bar omega 0. So that's what it looks like. So the debye waller factor will be uh, e to the minus all of this thing here. And just to, to talk a little bit about this debye waller factor, you remember its interpretation was that it was going to, it basically had to do with having smeared the interaction potential uh, around the otherwise very, very sharp Dirac delta function strong nuclear potential. It becomes smeared because of the vibration of the atom. And that basically produces, um, if you imagine this thing, uh, if you imagine uh, this thing, oh, I, I sort of have to write it down, I think. The debye waller factor looks like minus q dot u quantity squared, like that. And so this is it's the uh, exponent that we have worked out. And so you imagine that if this one, um, if the argument in front of q squared becomes very large, then the intensity is going to cut off rather rapidly as a function of q. And if we imagine what's happening as a function of temperature, if temperature becomes very, very large, then beta is very small. And then I get cot uh, hyperbolic of, um, uh, of a sum of cot hyperbolic, which then becomes actually very large. Um, and so at high temperatures, I'm going to have a large prefactor to my q squared. And this has to do with the vibrations becoming uh, more uh, of a larger amplitude. And therefore, my potential apparently appears to have grown in position space. On the other hand, if I go to t equals to zero, and this is quite interesting, 
Then, of course, I get code hyperbolic of an infinite number. But that becomes 1. It doesn't become 0. So that means that I will still have a Debye Waller factor. The intensity will still be knocked down towards, t, uh, towards a large Q. And can anyone uh, tell me why is it that there's still a Debye Waller factor when t is equals to 0 and I've taken out all thermal motion? Can anyone tell me why do I still have this apparent envelope function that which is suppressing the intensity towards high Q? Quantum fluctuations, excellent. So this is the zero point motion uh, which is being manifest um, uh, in the Debye Waller factor. So this is a this is a this is a, a quantum effect that we should see even at t equals to zero. Okay, with that I think I should be able to write down the whole um, cross section for scattering from these from this very simple type of solid. So and then we'll spend a, a few minutes uh, talking about that. So it, it's uh, healthy to. Um, healthy to have looked at these quite a bit because it, it really, when you're thinking about your data, as I've tried to advocate, it's, it's really valuable to, uh, to know the various things that can actually pop up. So let's see, so there's this guy. That's my nice dimensionalist number and the code, code, cottage is hyperbolic, um, half beta h bar omega zero. So this is my, uh, that is my Debye Waller factor, which we just said a few words about. And then comes, um, once again, that same dimensionless ratio, 2m h bar omega 0. Uh, this part is now basically writing down the two-point correlation function that we developed. And remember, there was that prefact out in front. Uh, but now I will have carried out my time integral which has produced these Dirac delta functions in frequency. And I end up producing this uh, expression, n omega 0, the Bose population factor, delta function h bar omega plus omega 0, and then n omega 0 plus 1 Dirac delta function h bar omega minus omega 0, like such. And then uh, finally close the parentheses. And that is the result of my um, calculation of the one phonon inelastic scattering cross-section for an Einstein solid, essentially. And just keep in mind that we've made a couple of approximations as we went along. We, we made the um, Born, what's it called? The, um, we made a Born uh, expansion and used the Born approximation to replace the T operator by the um, potential. And then we made a multi-phonon expansion and cast away everything but the one phonon term in the excitation spectrum. This produced uh, this beautiful uh, result. And <clears throat> I'd now like to look at this a little bit, point out a couple of more things about it. Um, so we've, we've talked about the... Oh, let's first look at the dimensions of it. I always like to do that just to make sure that we're on the right page. And you'll notice that this thing is dimensionless and these are dimensionless. These have dimension of 1 over energy. That's good because the scattering cross-section has dimension of 1 over energy. So that comes from the delta functions. Uh, we also know that the scattering cross-section has dimension of an area. Where does the area come from? It comes from the scattering length squares. So, th so that's an area per energy is what the partial differential scattering cross-section looks like. Now, um, this term here is only finite um, knowing that omega zero is a positive frequency associated with the Einstein uh, mode. Then this is only finite for negative values of, N of omega. Negative values of omega uh, correspond to actually receiving energy from the sample. And so this term actually corresponds to a phonon uh, annihilation term. So it corresponds to the neutron coming along and then getting a push basically from absorbing one quantum of energy, one quantum of vibration from an Einstein um, oscillator. And this term, on the other hand, is only finite when om omega is a positive number. That means that it corresponds to delivering energy to the sample. And so this is a creation term. Um, good. <clears throat> um, 
So then there's another interesting thing that, and very important uh, result I want to mention, which is that you see that there's sort of a, a similarity um, in the spectrum seen at negative energies and at positive energies. Now, in this particular case, it's not a huge surprise, perhaps. Uh, we have a peak at minus omega zero, and we have a peak at plus omega zero. Of course, you might say, well, it couldn't be anything else, because you have only one frequency involved in the problem, so it's sort of trivial. But it turns out that on very, very general grounds, the spectrum you see at positive frequencies is very closely related to the spectrum you see at negative frequencies. And there's a certain ratio in intensity between the positive and negative energy side. And this ratio obviously is obeyed also by this very, very simple model, but it holds more generally. And specifically, what we find is that the ratio of, let's, I'm now going to just call, I'm going to write intensity, because I'm thinking about an experiment where I'm measuring the inelastic scattering intensity. And so let's think about the intensity at the negative, um, at the negative energy side, divided by the intens intensity at the positive energy side. <clears throat> and if I look at this expression, you'll notice that on the negative energy side, the intensity is related to the Bose population factor n of omega. So this is n of omega. Um, you can put an omega zero if you want. Um, and on the, neg on the positive energy side, the intensity has to do with n of omega zero plus one. So that is the ratio between uh, the uh, negative energy side, or what we call the neutron energy um, energy gain side and the neutron energy loss side in intensity. That is the ratio. And I can rearrange this expression in a nice way, just divide by n of omega top and bottom. I get 1 divided by 1 plus 1 divided by n of omega 0. And you remember that this guy is the Bose population factor, which itself is 1 divided by 1 minus, sorry, which is 1 divided by e to the beta h by omega 0 minus 1. So this becomes 1 divided by 1 plus, and then e, e to the beta h bar omega 0 minus 1. So the plus is, is removed by the minus 1, and this ends up becoming e to the minus beta h bar omega 0. So the ratio between negative energy inelastic scattering and positive energy inelastic scattering is always e to the minus beta h bar omega 0. And this turns out to be a completely general result which we call a uh, detailed balance. And it popped up in our calculation essentially because throughout we assumed the sample was in thermodynamic equilibrium. And in order for that to be true uh, and for it to remain in thermodynamic equilibrium, um, there must be this ratio between the uh, transition rate for creation and annihilation um, and that is exactly what it is. Then it's coming out in this intensity ratio. And just to show you what that means uh, experimentally in the, uh, in the spectra that we might measure, let me just show you schematically what I would then expect here. If I am plotting the intensity of inelastic scattering as a function of energy transfer, and let's just do the case of the Einstein, um, uh, Einstein solid. And let's think about a situation where uh, KT, the Boltzmann constant times temperature, is much, much less, or let's say just less than h bar omega zero. OK, then what happens, that, what happens then is that this um, number becomes quite large. And therefore, e to the minus that large number becomes quite small. So I'm going to get a rather small intensity on the negative energy side. So at low temperatures, I'm going to see a measly little peak here at h bar, at minus h bar omega zero, and then at plus h bar omega zero. You know, they'll be completely symmetric around zero, but this one will be much weaker, and it will be weaker by this particular ratio, e to the minus beta h bar omega. So this would be a lowish temperature situation. If I go all the way to zero temperature, then this one goes away completely because I have no thermal energy to absorb from the system at all. And I only can create phonons, um, cannot annihilate phonons. On the other hand, if I go to very high temperatures, so KBT much, much greater than H bar omega zero, then uh, this number becomes very close to zero and e to the minus a very small number becomes essentially equals to 1. 
And then I basically must see peaks in my spectrum of equal strength at minus h by omega 0 and at, and at positive h by omega 0. Now, this type of uh, theoretical result, if you will, detailed balance, um, is very valuable to an experimentalist because as long as we ensure that our sample is in, is in thermodynamic equilibrium, then we know that the spectrum has to satisfy this condition. And if it doesn't, we have some sort of experimental problem that we need to work with. Uh, there's, there's just no excuse for violating this type of uh, condition, except for all sorts of interesting experimental issues that do crop up. And so many times we will use this to basically um, weed out various types of problems in our, in our setup, which then can help us, you know, having weeded those problems out, then we have greater confidence that we know what we're doing in terms of measuring the spectrum at positive energies. On the other hand, I'm not really extracting a lot of new information by both measuring positive energies and negative energies. We know that if it's in thermal equilibrium, then I need to have that ratio. So, you know, unless I, I would like to somehow use it to measure the temperature, then in principle I'm not going to learn anything new from measuring the negative energies. Um, uh, however, I would just say that for the reasons I said, uh, because of it being like a a test on the, the quality of the experiment, we very often like to measure on both sides to really understand what's, uh, what's going on with our experimental setup. Okay, do I have any questions so far on all of this? Yes? Oh, yeah, so the, 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 the uh, excellent comment is why do I call this a phonon? Uh, and a phonon ought to be a collective excitation. And that's, um, yeah, that, that's probably a fine uh, uh, concern. I, I'm not, uh, yeah, this, this would be, you could call it rather, I mean, okay, we're actually going to return a little bit later to the question of the, na of the naming of these types of excitations. Uh, so I, I will get back to it. And phonon, um, it turns out that that's really related to, to um, the concept of sound. It comes from Greek sound. And this is not an excitation that actually can be used to carry sound. So I think I have to agree that this is sort of tangentially related, if you will, to phonons. The theoretical description is essentially the same, but conceptually uh, there is something rather different about this type of excitation. So you could also call it a libration or uh, a type, type of optical mode. And of course, in a real material, you'll never have something which really behaves like this because there will always be some degree of interaction between these things, and then there'll be dispersion, and, and then things get more uh, complicated and interesting. So this was a very, very simplified case, which actually has managed to break away from what a, a phone and really should be. Okay, uh, other questions? No other questions, okay. Good. Then, um, let's see, I'm gonna... Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, we've yeah, have about 25 minutes left. Um, I think I would now like to um, to write the sort of generalized case. So this was our uh, case of an Einstein solid, um, and now I'd like to then write the case of an actual um, an actual phonon um, system with a, with a uh, collective phononic excitation. Um, now. Let me, let me emphasize one thing before I do write that down, um, an important aspect of this, which is in this expression, maybe we should just come over here a little bit. In this expression, there is no sort of, there are no sharp features in momentum space, you'll notice. All I have in terms of the Q dependence is this uh, De Waller factor and this overall tendency for the intensity to increase as I go to higher wave vector transfer. Now those are all, if you will, sort of single site phenomena. And this is, you know, the absence of any sharp features in momentum space is really reflecting uh, what the question was, was saying is that this is not a collective mode of excitation. There's no spatial coherence at all involved in this particular type of excitation. And in a sense, that boiled down to the two-point correlation function um, only being finite uh, when L was equals to L prime. And this then meant that there were no interference term, terms showing up in my expression. So this is now going to change when we allow for inter-site um, correlations. And to 
develop that expression is, is really too much for us here on the, on the blackboard. And so what I'd like to do is simply, by analogy, write down this expression. And then I'll say a few words about uh, its behaviors. And so I don't know if it's possible for us to see both of, both of this and what I'm going to write here. Maybe if you zoom out to the extent possible. Uh, then I'm going to basically mimic all of the terms that show up here are going to have their counterpart in the, in the general case of the phonon um, inelastic scattering. And basically what, what happens in terms of the derivation is that we now have to generalize the, um, the um, expansion in raising and lowering operators uh, in terms of the normal modes of the system. So we have to find all the normal modes of vibration, and then those have to be quantized in boson raising and lowering operators. And it's a pretty straight, I mean, it's a nominally rel relatively straightforward exercise, and there's nothing conceptually new about it. What is new, we could say, is that the cross-section now will have interference terms in position space. So let me write down some, uh, some version of this. So D2, over here a little bit. Oh, actually, let me, let me Get rid of that. And we will put this line. And then I'll do d2 sigma d omega d prime. And again, I'm just talking about one phonon process. I have really cast away a lot of other stuff. Um, and now let's see what comes in. So this is the same. The ratio of velocities showed up, as we discussed. The uh, magnitude of the scattering bound coherent scattering length shows up. And then now we do have these spatial interference terms, and that means that this double position summation, you remember there was a summation LL prime, this is now going to turn into a summation um, over reciprocal lattice vectors. So I get summation over reciprocal lattice vectors, and that implies the appearance of this 2 pi to the third over V0. You might remember that those showed up uh, when we worked with the um, Bragg diffraction cross-section. So that, that's all I can really say about that. Then we have our um, thereby Waller factor, as we, as we would expect. And I'm just writing it in that form, because it's going to be more complicated than what we wrote previously, involving all of the um, different modes and so on to develop the uh, mean squared deviation of the atom from its position. Uh, then comes um, a summation of all eigenmodes of the system. So this is where I have. Um, uh, found all the normal modes, and if I just have a, um, a single atom per unit cell, I'm going to have two transverse and one longitudinal acoustic mode of excitation. So J would be an index going over those three um, indexes, and then Q is is the uh, um, is the wave vector that lies within the first Brillouin zone, um, which is going to be which is going to be um, uh, showing up in my dispersion relation, and then this ratio. Remember this wonderful. Uh, dimensionless ratio of um, of a sort of like a recoil <coughs> a recoil energy so h bar q squared over two mass of atom I just have one atom per unit cell and then I have to divide by the energy of the phonon which is h bar omega j q so this is the same dimensional ratio which traces all the way back to the resolution of the position operator to raising and lowering operators so that one shows up again and then we have the term that has to do with, um, uh, with um, I'm going to just put a omega there. The term that, actually, let me put a Q, sorry. The term that has to do with um, a phonon annihilation. And then I'll have my delta function omega plus omega j of Q. Um, and then I have the corresponding um, creation term, which has my boson. Uh, number operator plus one times my Dirac delta function h h bar omega minus omega j of q like that. Now, I'm not completely finished because I have these spatial interference effects, and so this can't be the end of the story because this expression doesn't have any sharp features in momentum space. But I know these are collective excitations. The sharp features in momentum space uh, basically belong to this summation over reciprocal lattice vectors. And they look like this, and you have to just go and do the calculation to, to really appreciate where all of that comes from, like that. And here there's a Q minus little Q um, um, 
and let's see, minus tau. Like that. So these are very sharp features in momentum space. And there's a different term that belongs to the phonon annihilation and the phonon creation part. So this is the full e expression for the case of a Bravais lattice, with just one atom per unit cell. When we come to numerous atoms per unit cell, well, then it gets significantly more complicated, but it's, there's nothing conceptually uh, difficult about it. The sort of key feature that happens when we have a larger basis is there will be additional interference terms which, in a sense, mimic the structure factor that we're familiar with from, um, from uh, diffraction and using diffraction to solve um, static structures. Uh, let's see. Good. Um, yeah, I think I should... I want to... A couple of things I just want to point out before I, I switch to talking about... Um, I have some PowerPoint uh, images I'd like to, to show you um, regarding the sort of experimental situation. Um, I want to just draw the scattering triangle. Remember, I've several times emphasized the importance of uh, being aware of the scattering triangle. So I'd like to draw the scattering triangle in the case of phonon annihilation and in the case of phonon creation. So I'll have to do that shifting back here a little bit. Now this expression goes away. And basically, uh, so this will be phonon... Let's do an annihilation. A phonon annihilation process. So that means that I'm actually um, coming in with less energy than I come out with. So that means that my incident wave vector is to be short. That's k. And my scattered wave vector is to be longer. That's k prime. And I draw them like that tip to tip so I can easily develop the, um, the momentum transfer to the sample. And this would then be this vector here. This is Q. This is Q transferred to the sample. <clears throat> and if we now, we have to switch over here to remind ourselves that for, new, for phonon annihilation, Q has to match tau minus uh, little q. All right, so tau minus little q. So that means that uh, this Q has to be made up of... Um, a reciprocal lattice vector tau and a <coughs> and a um, crystal momentum associated with the phonon little q. Uh, so the, the triangle is a little bit more intricate, if you will. Uh, this reciprocal lattice vector might be very. You may choose different places to refer it to. You would prefer to choose the place which will make little q become a uh, reciprocal lattice vector in the first Brillouin zone. You'll operate entirely within the first Brillouin zone. So this is an image which corresponds to neutron coming in. It emerges more rapidly in this direction, and, in the, and this occurred because it absorbed a phonon which has this particular um, momentum within the first Brillouin zone associated with it. Um, and basically then by also looking at the energy transfer associated with that process, which is equals to h bar squared over 2 mass of neutron, and then k squared minus k prime squared. That's the energy transfer in the process. I know that must have matched, within the limits of this one phonon approximation, that must have matched h bar on omega j of q. Some mode must exist uh, whose energy is equal to h bar omega j of little q. And so basically by... Uh, going around and finding the places in momentum energy space where there is scattering, I'm going to be able to map out as a function of um, momentum transfer in the first Brillouin zone, the places where I see scattering will then trace out the dispersion relation. So this might be the situation where two transverse modes and a, and a longitudinal mode might look like that. I'm going to be able to trace out these dispersion relations. Um, I want to also mention that uh, you know this expression over here, if we can switch over here, it, it is a pretty monstrous and complicated thing to, uh, to be looking at. And it's actually so complicated that I've managed to make a little mistake, which I can now fix. Uh, so uh, this should actually have been, um, there should actually have been a dot product here. 
And this makes it, in a way, more interesting. Uh, this, this dark part is between momentum transfer and um, a dimensionless eigenvector. So I should actually put a hat on it. Phone and eigenvector. So this is the displacement vector. This is the uh, eigenvector describing the direction of displacement of the atom from mode number j with uh, momentum, crystal momentum, little q. And this actually turns out to be very, very handy. You can see that the, the uh, cross-section of scattering is going to be large for the mode whose displacement is oriented along momentum transfer. So I can set up momentum transfer on my instrument, and then I'll know that the phonon that is particularly large must be polarized along that direction. Let me show you an example of how I can use that to actually distinguish experimentally transverse and a, and a longitudinal phonon. So I'll just show you a little sketch of reciprocal space. So imagine that this is QX and this is QY, and I have reciprocal lattice points as such, some sort of orthorhombic lattice perhaps. And the, let's say that I wanted to measure a transverse acoustic phonon. Okay, what I'd need to do is I'd look at very, I'd look at relatively small crystal momentum transfer. So I'm going to have, this is my reciprocal lattice vector. So I want to operate with a rather small little q wave vector. This will be my reciprocal lattice wave vector, which brings me out to uh, the origin of what will be my Brillouin zone. And my momentum transfer, my overall momentum transfer looks like that. That's big Q, which is little q plus tau for a phonon creation process. Okay, but now remember that because of this term, which, uh, which I managed to correct, um, the phonons which will contribute to inelastic scattering in this geometry are those whose, um, whose um, eigenvectors will be oriented along the Q direction. Those which are perpendicular, I won't see at all. So if I place myself in this location in space, I'm going to see modes of excitation which, um, which have displacement vector in this direction, Ej of Q. Those are the ones that are going to contribute. The ones which are in this direction, which is some other, uh, other uh, um, eigenvector, those will actually not contribute because I'm almost perpendicular to those with my big wave vector transfer. So this, I think I might have confused you with too many of these little vectors. So I, let me just remove those because they don't really appear in my experiment. But suffice it to say, when, when my big momentum transfer is almost perpendicular to the crystal momentum, then I'll be measuring transverse phonons of excitation. On the other hand, if I was to set myself up uh, in a condition where, um, uh, where Q... Um, where this is my reciprocal lattice point, and if my wave vector transfer Q is here, and my crystal momentum is there, my reciprocal lattice vector is here, so everything is sort of parallel to each other, then I'm probing excitations that are polarized in the same direction as crystal momentum. That means it's an acoustic, that, sorry, that means it's a longitudinal mode of excitation. And so I can actually use this aspect of scattering cross-section to select out which mode, which particular type of phonon that I would like to be looking at. So this, this is, these are kind of the tricks of, of the trade. Okay, so I think that's has been quite a lot of equations and so on, as, as, uh, as, you, as I have belabored you with in other circumstances. Now I just want to give, show you a few slides regarding the, the sort of experimental situation surrounding this. Um, Oops, uh, and and let me just let me just get myself started here. Oh, um, uh, okay, here we go. All right, so I'm going to stand over here and, and say you, tell you a few words about this um, uh, about this uh, this story here. So I'm going to start off somewhat historically, and there was a question earlier today about um, whether we could call an Einstein mode a phonon, and I think I agreed with the questionnaire. Uh, this gentleman uh, um, 
Tem is his name, is a Russian physicist, lived in this period of time, and he actually was the person who gave, gave name to Phonon, as far as I can understand from, from various uh, historical documents and so on. Uh, and so he developed the concept and gave it name. Uh, I think there were many others involved probably as well, so I'm not sure it's an authoritative description of who did what. Uh, but it's interesting to read if you are familiar with German. Uh, for some reason, I have it in German. Uh, he basically says that by introducing the concept of a phonon as a quantum of a um, vibration, that really facilitates the calculation substantially. So that, that seems like just, you know, it works, but I'm not putting a lot of, like, physical significance to it, but it basically functions. And this point was sort of emphasized by... Another Russian phys physicist, Frankel, uh, who lived in this period of time, 1894 to 1952, and he actually, he says, um, let me just come back a little bit, sorry. So he, he says, uh, now just as for light and electrons, it's possible to associate the acoustic waves with certain particles which we, uh, which we shall call um, phonons, and to replace the study of the heat oscillations forming the waves by the study of the motion of the corresponding phonons. So, so he, um, he basically is, is saying that this sort of has the same standing as, as, as a photon. And it's interesting that he has a little star there. And if you see what that corresponds to, is this comment, he says, is not in the least intended to convey hereby the impression that such phonons have real existence. On the contrary, the possibility of their introduction rather serves to discredit the belief in the real existence of photons. So this is sort of at an early stage. And he's saying, well, because I can just introduce a phonon in this haphazard matter, that way which is just sort of a way to do a calculation, it's analogous to a photon, and that means that the photon also is just some sort of fluke of mathematics. And of course, nowadays we, we have full confidence in the reality of, of a photon uh, as, a, as, a, as a fundamental particle. Um, so we've, we've sort of come full circle in a sense. And so now because the photon is accepted likewise, in a sense, should we now also accept the phonon as being something which has true reality? And the point I wanted to make in these uh, couple of slides is that, in a sense, experimentally, we have arrived at that point, in that we can actually see these phonons and, as being a perfectly natural uh, and appropriate way to, to consider the effect of scattering of neutrons from a crystal. When we look at the pattern of scattering, we really require the concept of a phonon, which has interacted as a collective excitation with the neutron and caused it to scatter and change its momentum and energy. Okay, so that was the sort of historical uh, perspective. And I'm going to continue along that uh, a little bit uh, in uh, describing, it's, it's really quite interesting that, that long ago, um, you know, well, uh, I guess uh, uh, 20 years or so after the development of quantum mechanics, maybe it's not so surprising that people would have worked it out, but they basically had rather elegant ways of dealing with vibrational excitations in solid based on this concept of a phonon. But if you read this little uh, message in the paper by Robert, uh, uh, ben, I don't see it, Ben Stock, sorry. Um, if, I, if you read that, you'll see that he says, in the scattering of neutrons, because that is what he's considering, uh, we typically don't uh, keep track of the energy of those scattered neutrons. We just keep track of their direction. So he's, in a sense, talking in terms of this uh, differential scattering cross-section that we started with, in which you're just detecting how many neutrons reached your detector. And he's saying that if that's all we measure, then we are measuring some sort of sum of all phonons, and it, it's really just kind of a mess that we have to deal with. And so he, he didn't really have, even though he had all of the theoretical framework, he didn't have in his mind the possibility of actually using this um, scattering cross-section to have a more refined understanding of the inelastic scattering. Because experimentally, there was really no understanding of how you would do such a measurement. And that came uh, several years later, not that much later, in work carried, up, uh, carried out uh, up in the northern reaches, uh, a little bit north of uh, Toronto, up in a place called Chalk River. So it's a very, very remote and isolated place, which we sometime visit, sometimes visit to do neutron scattering experiments. And this is the um, place. Uh, where uh, Bert, uh, Bert Brockhaus, uh, who was the inventor of the triple axis, spec axis spectrometer, actually did his work. Um, and um, I'm going to show you next a picture of the instrument that he developed in one of these uh, reactors. If 
thing is actually the NRU reactor where the first uh, incident was. I could, I could be wrong on that. Uh, uh, but it was certainly at Chalk River. So here he is, uh, Bert Brockhaus, next to an instrument which is called the triple axis spectrometer. And I think this is in 1957. And this is a very, very elegant machine which you're going to hear more about in the presentation by Steve Nagler. So I think I won't spend a lot of time describing it, but I might just briefly tell you that, in a sense, it is the, like the, the cardinal components of a neutron spectrometer in this machine. So it, it basically does the job. And it does it by uh, having two spectrometers within it. Spectrometer is something by which we can uh, select or determine the energy of the neutron. And this is done through crystal diffraction, so I have what's called a monochromator, which will allow neutrons to reflect to the sample only if they have a specific energy. Hmm? Oh yeah, sorry. Now, this, this, is the, this is the monochromator, and it allows neutrons to pass through only if they have the particular correct energy or the desired energy. And likewise, then I have the sample, which is uh, somewhere here, I think. And then at this location, we have the crystal analyzer. And it only allows neutrons to reach the inner sanctuary of the detector if they have a specific energy. So by setting the conditions of the monochromator and the analyzer, I can determine the incident energy, the incident kinetic energy of the neutron, and the scattered kinetic energy of the neutron. And in the difference between the two, how much energy must be delivered to the sample in order that I can actually have a neutron be detected in this detector back here. And so th these are his beautiful charts. Uh, sort of mapping out essentially uh, this scattering triangle that I was talking about. Uh, he had elaborate ways of doing that. Of course, no computers essentially at those times, so everything had to be done geometrically with uh, paper and pencil. Um, and uh, he was able to really early on here, this is in, well, in the 50s, uh, measure these spectra, which are essentially the intensity of scattering as a function of the difference in energy between this incident and, and final uh, diffract. Uh, final um, spectrometer, and you see, you see that indeed uh, there are peaks occurring in the spectrum, and these peaks correspond to specific conditions of satisfying the requirement that uh, crystal momentum transfer um, matches wave vector transfer and energy transfer matches matches the energy of the corresponding phonon. And so, from all of from the location of these peaks in the spectra. He was then able to develop uh, dispersion relations. This is momentum transfer on the, on the x-axis and energy transfer on the, on the y-axis. And this was just a tremendous achievement in a sense because this is where the very first time that you could actually see the reality of these phonons actually jumping out from you on the instrument. You know, they, they really are, this is something real which is observed just as real as uh, what one might see at a, at a particle accelerator, except the phonon actually um, is only you know, only exists and only is uh, real within the confines of the solid, something that exists within the collective state of the material. But still, uh, within those limits, it is a perfectly reasonable and, and a real uh, collective object. And of course, going forward, uh, more elegant experiments were done. This is also by the Brockhaus, Brockhaus and his collaborators. Uh, and here you have a beautiful uh, dispersion relation uh, for normal modes that, uh, that you see jumping out from experiments on the instrument. Um, and, of course, there's, this is basically the, um, the basis for our understanding and verification of the concept of normal modes of excitation in solids. And uh, now I want to show you just a brief view of where it stands today, what you can measure, in a sense, uh, regarding phonons. And, of course, I have very little time, so I'm just, I, I just want to show you, you know, what, what happens when you fast forward, um, uh, for, uh, let's see, 40, 50, uh, what, how many years, 40 years or so, uh, then, um, uh, then, then we come to an instrument such as this, at the spallation neutron source, and we, I won't show the details because this is something that, um, that um, Steve Nagler is going to, going to go through in much, uh, much greater detail. Um, but um, I, I want to show you the beautiful data that come out from this machine, and again, related, in a sense, to this question of whether phonons are a reality or whether they're some sort of mathematical convenience. And these images show you the uh, resolved momentum and energy dependence of intensity of neutron scattering measured on one of these time of flight machines. And what's shown here is just a cut through one particular slice in energy momentum space. 
but the machine is collecting all of momentum space and all of and all of or some range of energies, and you have all of the intri intricacies of the dispersion relations manifest in the data in these, uh, as, as indicated in, in these uh, plots here. Um, and there's just a host of, of valuable information which is extracted. Not only the the normal modes of excitation uh, that we that we see standing out so clearly here, but also additional features that have to do with the with the uh, width of these excitations, which talk about uh, anharmonic effects and deviations from, uh, from really long-lived modes of excitation. Phonons can actually scatter from each other, and this gives a finite lifetime, which is also detected in these neutron scattering experiments. So experimentally, the answer uh, to the, the question that was uh, raised in those early days is that certainly phonons are uh, not only uh, a convenient calculational tool, but also correspondingly have a great uh, experimental significance and with these new experimental tools, we have the ability to, um, to use this uh, phonon scattering cross-section to get tremendous detail about the dynamic properties uh, of materials. So with that, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, unless you have any questions, should we, should we ask? I'm, I'm certainly, I think we've sort of exhausted for time, but if you have any questions, I'm, I'm very happy to, to uh, answer. Okay, very good. So we'll uh, reconvene next week.